This is the Puck Poolies Podcast with Matt Larkin and Stephen Ellis. Hello and welcome to a new edition of Puck Poolies. It's Matt Larkin here, as always, with Stephen Ellis. But not just Stephen Ellis, possibly a haunted version of Stephen Ellis. Right before we pressed record, Stephen, you were telling me that a Nerf gun went off in the room you're in. So what's going on? Is there a ghost where you are right now? I kind of hope not. This is not my room. This, uh, I'm just uh, borrowing a room today to, to film the show. And um, that was kind of strange. All of a sudden, I, I see a bullet flying. And I don't exactly know where it came from. So um, if I get hit by a Nerf bullet and die, uh, that's uh, let's just say uh, we have camera evidence to show uh, what happened. And do you believe in ghosts? That is maybe the more important question here. <laughs> I, I guess I have to now, right? Because there's no way of explaining why that happened. This 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 house is over 100 years old, so there's a very good chance there is a ghost in here. I'm not a huge believer in ghosts, but uh, there is one. Like I had a friend who was really obsessed with the paranormal, and he listened to like that radio show, Coast to Coast. And if anyone was ever going to try and become a ghost, it would have been him. And he did pass away. R.I.P. You and my buddy. Um, but when he passed away, so he he used to tell me. Uh, that there was like a thing you can't, if you wake up at th- exactly 3 a.m., that it's a ghost taunting you. And it always creeped me out, like if we were having sleepovers or whatever. And then it never happened. But then the day after he died, it happened. I woke up at exactly 3 a.m. So I'm like, oh my God, it's him. He's a ghost and he's teasing me. So I don't know. I'm, I'm not really a believer, but that was pretty weird when that happened, I gotta say. Well, so I gotta say the, the coast to coast AM, and that is a random reference. I haven't thought about that place and that, that show in a while. I, I remember one time tuning in when i got uh grounded when i was a kid and they they claim to have the zodiac killer on there (laughs) (laughs) that's awesome it's a great show i mean it's great for what it is you know it's entertaining uh all right so moving on from ghosts and nerf guns one of our more interesting starts to a show which i have no regrets about uh what's going on in your league we know i'm out so my league right now is just basically my dad and Michael Buble fighting over rules in their semifinal matchup, and they're both probably wrong, and they're accusing each other of cheating, and it's pretty entertaining for me from the sidelines. That's all I got. What's happening in your league right now in your playoffs? Yeah, uh, so for me, I'm. I, this is the most boring week of fantasy hockey because I got a buy uh, in my main my six team league last week every team like there was no chance of any team moving positionally so it was kind of just like okay just make sure your team's ready to go for two weeks down the line and we've got the quarterfinals going for four teams and actually one of them might be a pretty big upset where the third place team could get knocked out uh sorry mariano uh and then uh in uh, my other league i got knocked out uh like two or three weeks ago, but I was finishing out the regular season. But my goal was to see if I could knock out one of the guys I played against in the final few weeks. And I knocked out a guy who he needed to win off of a points tie. Or no, he needed to basically win because the team he was playing against had a points tiebreaker, but they lost. So he needed to win. He had like a 40 point advantage on the last day. I beat him by two points, Ooh. knocked him out of playoffs with on the last day in the last game of the, uh, of the fantasy league regular season. So uh, I'm not playing fantasy this week. Uh, I'm literally just going for my Tim Hortons pick three pick player thingy. I got twice now. I got up to six days in a row and lost. So I had lost a chance of free coffee, but uh, uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's Monday seem to be terrible for me when it comes to that, because there's like two games and you just Mm got to hope one of those guys scores. And that often did not work out. So I have nothing to do in fantasy this week. I see. Yeah, that's sort of the when you play in the small leagues with a lot of buys, it gets interesting that way. It's funny. And I I got a revelation about small leagues from our colleague, Scott Maxwell, who's playing in a a tiny fantasy baseball league. But he came up with a really cool idea that I wanted to share because it applies to any sport, really. Uh, So it's they only have three teams in the league, but they each drafted two teams. They have their their major league club and their minor league club, and then they can trade back and forth between their own teams. They can send guys up to the pros and send them down to the minors to try and like help their main team. That's a really cool idea. So if you're ever struggling to find people but still want to have a fantasy league, that's a great way to do it. I love that approach. Uh, But Steven, let's move on now. Let's help people with their normal fantasy hockey leagues. Let's do some pickups of the week. 
All right, let's start off with uh, Jake Allen, the shallow pickup who, uh, at, at the time of recording this, last night had an awesome game against the Toronto Maple Leafs. I was there. They need important games like that down the stretch if they want to have a chance of making the playoffs. It is a tough uh, hill to climb, but uh, good to see him play as well as he did. That's right. And important is the right word because they are still in a competitive state. We know the Devils are unlikely to make the playoffs, but they're not out yet. They're still a talented team. And now you have Jake Allen, who's available in 68% of leagues, which is crazy to me right now. He's starting on a, a pretty good team, a competitive team that's been unlucky. So far as a Devil, he's 4-2, and two, 9.25 save percentage. And he has started six of eight games since he came over in that trade on deadline day. So that's a very valuable fantasy setup for the stretch run. And Jake Allen could actually be quite a needle mover because the Devils... They're playing better than their record. We know that they had a lot of bad injury luck early in the season, bad goaltending, but they're not actually a bad team. I'm sure they're going to be in the playoffs next year. So we could see this team playing pretty good hockey down the stretch with a pretty good goalie. So Jake Allen, to me, it's crazy that he's available in 68% of leagues. He should be owned in every single league right now. He could easily be a top 15 goalie, maybe even top 12 for the rest of the season. Okay, I like that one. This is another one I'm actually really liking, Timothy Logan, and I've been kind of against him this year. I thought that he's not had a good year, but it seems like ever since Joel Edmondson was created there, like since the deadline, he's been really good, whether he's played with Edmondson or not. Uh, seeing him kind of get those late minutes uh, in a game or even playing the power play, it's good to see him kind of having this revival that he really needed because the skills there, the execution wasn't this year, but now it's starting to look like he's looking a bit better right now. That's right. He's available in 24% of leagues, and he's finally, I guess because of all these injuries on the Leafs decor, he's getting a little more trust from Sheldon Keefe. That's always been a problem with Lilligren. He just doesn't get enough runway because he makes mistakes, and those tend to stand out more than his underlying numbers, which are usually a lot better than the eye test. Uh, but now it's like I'm recommending him as a medium league pickup. It's not even because he's playing on the top power play unit right now, which he is. Because we know that's not going to last once Morgan Riley's back. And I don't think Morgan Riley's going to miss too much time. But that's a nice bonus. Even without that factored in, though, he's becoming uh, somewhat of a stat stuffer. So he's got 14 points in his last 18 games. Quite good for anyone in terms of defensemen in fantasy. He's averaging more than 20 minutes a night over that span, too. So the role has grown. And he's averaging more than two blocks per game on the season. Well north of a hit per game. So he's going to be like a 30, 35 point. 150 block 100 hit player so to me it's it's a stat profile that's kind of similar to someone like maybe a justin falk pretty useful if you have a multi-category league and the thing about timothy lilligren as you alluded to steven it's not like it's totally out of nowhere timothy lilligren was a first round pick in 2017 he was supposed to be good right now he's sort of doing what he was supposed to do so that pedigree always matters when you see someone breaking out when they're sort of doing what scouts always assumed they were going to do it matters so uh i feel like this is a new sustainable level for timothy lilligren yeah and he was a guy that originally before his draft year people were talking as a potential top five pick mm -hmm. and i know even some very early mock drafts had him like first or second overall so it, it, to me it was just a matter of time until he put it together i just felt like you look at what rasmus sandin was able to do this year and i think it's like oh did they trade the wrong guy and i i I would argue yes, 100%, but Lilgren, I think, is the skill was there. He just had to put it together. He's kind of one of these new age defensemen where he's got some offensive skill. He's got some great, like, he can move the puck, but it just playing in his own zone can be difficult, which is not exactly what you want to see from a defenseman. But I think that, uh, I think he's a good pickup. And this is one I'm actually really excited about, Philip Kurashev, because I was a huge believer of him in his draft year. Uh, I just thought this is a, I, I've always had kind of a soft spot for Swiss players because they just play a really interesting style. They play kind of like Finnish guys where not always the most skilled, but they'll work hard. And of Kurashev, there was some skill there. So it's good to see him kind of having a good season this year. Sure, you know, opportunities are probably a little better than he'd have than on other teams, but uh, I'm liking what he's doing right now. For sure. And speaking of Swiss, how about uh, Roman Yossi, by the way, maybe swooping in to steal the Norris Trophy, but that's a discussion for another day. Yeah. Uh, Philip Khrushchev available in 92% of leagues, and I can't take full credit for this one, of course. We had Nick Alberga on the pod last week, and he recommended Khrushchev as one of the, the uh, better pickups to consider for your fantasy playoffs. But I want to bang the drum a little bit more here. 
Uh, it just feels like people have not caught on to a player that has 24 points in his last 25 games. That's crazy to have that level of production, basically point per game, over a third of a season and be available in 92% of leagues. So it tells us that the Chicago stink is real. Yes, the plus minus is not great. So that's always going to knock some value off any of those players on the Blackhawks if your league counts that category. But everything else, pretty handy from Kurashev. He's got 47 points in 65 games. So even the entire season sample is solid. He's Connor Bedard's right winger. He is the center on the top power play unit. It's kind of like, what more do you want? This guy checks every box except for plus minus. And it's not just a little hot streak when you've got 24 points in 25 games. Like this is showing he can do it over a longer haul. So he really needs to be added in many more leagues. Yeah, I don't think he's a long-term guy that's going to be putting up a lot of points. Like in, when Blackhawks get better, he's not going to be playing with the guys he's playing with right now. But um, you can't argue with the numbers right now. And it's good because like every night he's a threat. And uh, I picked him up in my, my deeper fantasy league. Not that that mattered because I came second last in my group but whatever uh and the wtf pickup logan thompson yes he's available in 29 percent of leagues and out of all the pickups that we've discussed this is the priority pickup uh in the short term so jake allen we know is going to have value for the rest of the season as a fantasy goalie right now for vegas if you're trying to win this week and you're in a head-to-head matchup aiden hill is out and Logan Thompson slots right in to be a stud starter. We know that the Vegas Golden Knights starting goalie position is always extremely valuable for fantasy. And yes, I know Yuri Patera played on uh, Tuesday night, but that's because Vegas had a back-to-back. And Logan Thompson played the day before. So Vegas is going to ride Logan Thompson nonstop until Aiden Hill's back. They are motivated to win right now, Vegas, despite all their wild trades they're not guaranteed a playoff spot because of all the injuries that they're dealing with so they're in a win now like desperation mode which means they're going to be competitive they're going to be fighting hard to win these games and i think logan thompson has potential to to turn the tide of a match for you if he's available and you can add him in your head-to-head matchup this week imagine if they miss the playoffs like it's it's so funny even though i like the villainy of vegas I also think it would be hilarious if, if after all of this, they still may miss the playoffs. And I just knowing how Vegas is, they'll win the Stanley Cup the next season. That's just how that would work with that franchise. Uh, the tip of the week is to make load management your friend, not your enemy. Yeah, so late in the season, this can apply to head-to-head or Roto. Um, a lot of people, <coughs> Michael Buble, <coughs> start to whine about uh, their stars getting sat, and a lot of people prefer to move uh, their fantasy championship week back if it's head-to-head because you have so many players getting sat if teams are starting to get locked into their playoff spots. And that's one route you can go. You can whine. You can be upset. Oh, my stars aren't playing, but they're too good. I can't drop them. (laughs) Or you can make lemonade out of the situation and use it to your advantage. So the Leafs are actually a good example because that's a team that's been locked into a playoff spot and like not really moving up and down for a long time. So they have someone like Mitch Marner who's out, right? Their top line right winger. What happens? Max Domi jumps up to the top line playing with Matthews and Bobby McMahon jumps up to the second line. Both players get a, a boost in value. So what you're looking for here, rather than dwelling on your stars that aren't playing, think, okay, Let's focus on the other players on these teams that benefit from the load management. So that's a way to sort of use it to to your advantage and look for those players that are getting temporary boosts in value. And the types of teams you want to target are teams that are not really positioned to make much of a move in the standings. So those teams have more motivation to sit their stars because they're sort of getting ready for the playoffs. So exploit it. Find the guys who benefit instead of whining and being upset that some of your players are going to sit down the stretch. Yeah, like part of the th- the reason why I picked the schedule to be what it is for our fantasy league, where it basically goes as late as possible, is I like the challenge of the championship series being down to which team can manage those four pickups the best, knowing a lot of their star players are going to sit. And, you know, um, the one kind of downside is, you know, Tampa is still trying to cement their spot there and like, the guy I would, I'm, I'm kind of putting myself on the final already, um, even though I'm, I'm not there yet. But basically, the guy that I've been battling with all year long has Kucherov, and the, he's going to keep trying to go all out this year. But he's also got Elias Pettersson. Are they going to sit him? Uh, 
there's a bunch of guys that they could sit. But mm-hmm. then you're also looking at it and saying, okay, well, some of these teams like that the there's almost like you won't see the the crappier teams that probably should be sitting their players out like chicago maybe should just sit out bedard the rest of the season because they keep winning and keep taking themselves out of that <laughs> spot to get celebrating it's almost like the the crappier teams should be the ones sitting their guys out for that um like i know montreal canadians fans are getting like i think they're confused on what how to feel because like a couple of days ago they had the fifth best odds again in the first pick now they got like the seventh and yeah. go down eighth and it just keeps going the wrong direction uh again depending on how you view it but uh uh i'm that yeah the, the challenge of like oh like i might not have a couple of my star players like philip forsberg might sit out for a couple of games so, or these guys like that could be pretty interesting i guess the good news is i have jack hughes as my star guy right now and he's like having to carry the devils right now but uh i don't know yeah. i think that like kind of makes this a bit more fun it's it's an interesting challenge and I, I will say like we did in my league bump it back because it, it determined the championship twice in a span of five years like i lost the championship one year because Kerry price uh they just they didn't play him on the final day uh and then and then another year i got eliminated i think it was a semifinal, but because my opponent picked up the backup uh of because my starting goalie wasn't playing my opponent grabbed the backup before i could and then two years ago same thing the the team that should have won the championship didn't because all their starters or a lot of their stars didn't play the final weekend so we decided okay we we it's it is a challenge but we would rather be determined by merit so we've like this we're already in our semi-final week this week and our championship is next week i know most leagues are are just in their quarterfinal week this week so that's why we we bumped it back Okay. What's our special segment? Okay. Steven, I'm going to turn the floor over to you for this one because I want to look ahead to Keeper Leagues. I want to look at NHL-affiliated prospects. And what we mean by that, listeners, is prospects who are drafted. They're already property of NHL teams, but they're not in the league yet. So, Stephen, I want to, I want you to identify, because this is important for sleepers for next year for people, uh, who are some... NHL affiliated prospects who have gained the most value for you in terms of keeper leagues heading into next season. All right. Well, I'm going to start off with Logan Mayu and the Montreal Canadiens. Obviously, you know, a lot of questions kind of heading into this pro career, what was going to happen there, given the past there. Um, I'm looking just solely on the on ice performance here. He's got 42 points in 63 games at the Laval Rocket. He was an AHL All Star this year. Downright, no question about it, one of the best defense, but one of the best offensive defensemen in the AHL. For me, I still got questions about his long term defensive abilities. I do think, you know, for a guy his size, uh, he's very physical, but, you know, can get it to take some dumb penalties, be out of position a little bit too much. But the raw skill is there. And I think the one thing to keep in mind was, you know, he he only played 19 games during that 2021 season. Um, the following year, he only played 12 games due to the suspension and injuries and everything. This is a guy that had to do a lot of catching up. And last year, putting up 53 points, 25 goals in the OHL, obviously was pretty impressive. But uh, you kind of like he was a 19 year old defenseman. You kind of was hoping he'd have a really good year. Um, but this year, to see the offense he's had, like he could come close to matching what he put up in the AHL or the OHL last year. That's very impressive. He's just done so much of the caring of that that group. Could hit 50 points this year. Isn't far off a 20 goal. So a guy that scores and and, and can throw hits and do all that. That's impressive. I think, and again, I'm not totally sh- like convinced he's a top four defenseman in the NHL because of his defensive deficiencies. But from what I've seen just from year to year, I wouldn't, I'm not going against him right now because there's just been so much improvement. I think he's a pretty solid two way defender that's got a good future. And with Montreal just kind of looking to put all these young guys in next year, like, I wouldn't be, I would almost expect Lane Hudson to spend time in the AHL next year, if not the whole season. When it comes to Mayu, I could see him making a, a, a case to at least start the season in the NHL. Mm-hmm. So from a long-term perspective, I really like what uh, Logan Mayu could do. Interesting. I wonder if in terms of fantasy, the profile there could end up being kind of Tony D'Angelo-ish uh, in terms of, well, also the off-ice concerns that sort of come with the player coming into the league, but also someone who isn't necessarily a top four player, but uh, has that power play ability and offensive acumen to be a top four value, like in terms of what they bring in on a fantasy team. So I wonder if that's going to be the ceiling for Logan Mayu. Like he might end up being a better in fantasy than than real life type of player. 
I do think so. And and to be fair, like I think his defensive game has actually improved quite a bit this year. So it's definitely not out of the question that he could play a bigger role. Mm -hmm. Um, But, you know, like I'd still take David Reinbacher's defensive play over him type of thing. And, and, and you've obviously got Caden Gooley and, and Arbor Jack guy who are not as offensively inclined that could do some of that other stuff. So you might not need him to be this like super defensive stalwart guy. He could probably play the power play. Like again, he's just so good with the puck. Um, so I think the potential is really high here. I just, I also think for a lot of Canadians fans, pump the brakes because there are a lot of people who are like anointing him as like and then like a, a future star in the NHL. Um, I think he's going to be a pretty solid player, though. Mm-hmm. And we know, of course, making it as a francophone player in Montreal is no joke. It doesn't happen all that often, so it'll be interesting to see what happens with Mayu. Um, let's move on now to uh, Carolina Hurricanes prospect, and the Canes to me, they're kind of a team that is low-key starting to build a decent prospect pool, especially when they didn't give up any of their best ones to get Jake Gensel. Uh, so tell me more about Bradley Nadeau. I will say that the Hurricanes have one of the best scouting departments in the league. Uh, every time, every draft, I'll be texting people or talking to people, and it's like, which team really like impressed you the most? And Carolina's always near the top. They're never going to end up having the you know a superstar prospect because they're a good team and they're picking late. But they pick some unbelievable value. I don't know if any other team at at where where they picked uh, Bradley Nadeau last year, which was, I believe, yeah, thirtieth overall. I don't think any other team would have done that. But Carolina saw the potential here, and last year at the Penticton V's, he put up forty five goals and one hundred thirteen points in fifty four games in the BCHL. So yeah, he's playing Junior A, but those numbers are some one of the best seasons we've ever seen from uh, a player. On uh, in, in junior eight in a draft year, like Alex Newhook was kind of one of the gold standards um, in the last couple of years. I think he had like 99 or 100 points, uh, and that looked incredible. But what Nadeau was doing last year was outstanding. So when he goes to the University of Maine, you know, not one of the top programs, they are playing in the NCAA tournament this weekend, so they do have a shot at the Frozen Four. But you know, it's not getting the attention that Boston College or Boston University or, or you know teams like that are. 46 points in 36 games top scorer on the team like just fantastic player he's the only nhl drafted prospect he does get to play with his brother too so that's cool they got that good connection but with him i i wouldn't be surprised if he's in the nhl in two years and i don't think he gets enough attention for how good of a of a scorer he is he's a really good playmaker too i think that was something we really saw last year the big thing for me, he's not big. He's five foot ten. He's one hundred and seventy two pounds. He doesn't really play a physical game. Uh, I feel like from what I've seen this year compared to last year, where this year he had to be a bit more physical. He has thrown some more hits. I don't know the exact number, but just from watching him, he's more willing to get into the dirty areas and do that. But that's not what you're looking for him there. You're, you're looking for some guy who could bring speed and can be just very, very good with the puck. And when he makes a move, like either to pass or a deke, like he's got it all planned out what he wants to do and a guy like that who's as smart as he is is going to have a good nhl career so i really like uh, bradley nadeau excellent um and next up this is a guy i know you've been really high on uh for a while now and he's having the classic 19 year old just running through everybody uh in major junior with the Oshawa generals uh cal ritchie colorado avalanche first round pick what are you seeing from him this year that's getting you excited for fantasy long term I'm, I, you know, I'm, to mention Alex Newhook earlier, I think uh, that Cal Ritchie's kind of Colorado, but like, well, before I guess Casey Middlestad came, but I was looking at it as Ritchie was going to be like that long term number two center for that team. And uh, even if he's number three, I think he brings a ton of value. You see his numbers this year 80 points in 50 games. He had shoulder surgery after the U18 World Championship and missed a big chunk of the season, didn't take part in training camp, was kind of thrown to the wolves. And he was putting up just unbelievable numbers, so much so that I thought he should have made Canada's World Junior team after like playing six games. Like <laughs> this guy just proved that uh, he could do so much. Last year, he had 59 points in 59 games. You know, point per game is great, but for a draft eligible player, that's not, you know, in the top end of things. But what he was able to do was just show how good of a two-way threat he was. And he got to play with Macklin Celebrini during that U18s, and it just showed how much he grew as a player that year. When he was a rookie, he put up a lot of good numbers. He was one of those play drivers. But when it came to being this an 18-year-old last year, it was more about let's develop the overall game. 
And I feel like you yeah, see his speed, his smarts, and his skill with the puck, you know, all very important attributes from a center. The one thing we've really noticed with him this year was just him taking control. It's like, okay, I'm not here to just develop anymore. I'm here to dominate. And the numbers don't lie. 80 points in 50 games, a tremendous playmaker. I think the the ceiling's really high here. I, I, I haven't put a prospect list uh, in a while. Uh, the top prospects in the league, I will be doing one in the summer. I could tell you that this guy might be top 15 now. I, I, I said in my draft rankings that he was going to be one of the steals of the draft. And I had him at number 19. He went number 27. I think he's like, it's, it's going to be a huge value pickup for that team. He's got size. He's six foot two. He's not afraid to hit guys. Uh, he doesn't take ton penalties. He's so good with the puck. I, I could see him being a 50 ish point guy in the NHL. No problem. And then yeah, he's going to add that real life value. That's going to get him that ice time because he's going to, he is so smart because he's so defensively responsible. Um, so like he's not a, a super high ceiling player, I, I'd say in terms of offensive points, but I, I'm very confident he'll be getting 50 points a year and, and get that ice time to make it worth it. Yeah. Very interesting. And, and it's funny. The next guy on your list is taken one pick after Cal Ritchie in the first round of the 2023 draft. And similarly, someone who's really dramatically changed his value this year was perceived to be a huge reach at the time. And to go from not just reach to, okay, that was a good pick to go from reach to possible steal. Easton Cowan has had a pretty unbelievable season with the London Knights. So what are you thinking about with him right now? Yeah, Toronto Maple Leafs prospect. We're not going to do any revisionist history here. I know I was shocked when he was picked when he was. I know a lot of NHL scouts were shocked. Everybody else who kind of covered prospects were like, whoa, really? But the one kind of prevailing theme here this year for Easton Cowan is it seems like the Leafs coaching staff believed that he was going to continue physically growing. And he has, he's actually had a lot of weight, uh, mostly muscle, obviously uh, he's grown a couple inches since, you know, his the beginning of his draft season. And he's just continuing to figure out how to use, you know, he, he can not a huge guy, but to kind of use that frame to his, to his advantage to kind of be a more effective player. And you look at the season he's had, like I don't know what his point total is. I think he's close to like 40 games or something in a row with points. Uh, he set a London Knights record, 34 goals, 96 points in 54 games. Uh, so he wasn't going out there and just getting like five, six points every single night. He, he didn't finish up a hundred something points, but 96 points in a draft plus one year is actually still quite impressive because assuming he doesn't make the Leafs out of camp next year. And right now I'm not convinced he won't make the Leafs out of camp. Uh, I think that this is, a guy who should be able to put up 110, 115 points next year for the London Knights because they're always good. You can subtract a few key players, but they'll continue to fill in with some talent. And we do expect them to be a contender next year for the Memorial Cup. And when I'm saying that he could make the Leafs next year, I think it, his value is a very much a middle six player uh, who can, you know, do a lot of the things that they probably wish Nick Robertson would have done, which is, you know, Nick Robertson's not a big guy, he doesn't hit. He's been injured a bunch with Easton Cowan. He loves to throw hits. He brings in energy. He's got a great shot. He's also an exceptional playmaker. Um, we saw him at the World Juniors kind of just get overshadowed. It it really did not look like an impressive performance for him. He had two points, and I think like one, one was the empty net goal, and another was assist, I want to say, in the, the quarterfinal. Um, it wasn't a great showing for him, but all he did after that was just become one of the best players in the OHL. He has had to prove player or teams wrong and scouts wrong basically throughout his career like his draft minus one year he's playing junior b uh mostly because the london knights didn't have space for him he had a slow start to his full-time junior career last year and then really took off when it mattered in the playoffs he has continued to punch above his weight i think that this is he's not going to be again a huge point producer in the nhl but what i think his value here is is that he had such a he took such a huge leap this year that I wouldn't be surprised if he takes an even bigger leap next year. Mm -hmm. And I think that ceiling there, there's the Toronto tax. Obviously, a lot of Leaf fans will be paying attention if you're in a pool of Leaf fans. But I don't know how many people really kind of truly believe that this guy can go very far. And I think you can take a chance on this one as a long-term player where he will throw hits. And he'll continue if he puts gets put in a defensive zone. I think he's got the skill to put up points, but he's going to go out there and bring that energy, throw hits, block shots, things like that. That you know, triple, quadruple threat type player. I think there's a lot of value there. 
For sure. And, and it's funny. I remember talking to him uh, at the draft, like at the podium or, or the, the little the mini podiums uh, where he came after he was picked. He was so excited because he loves Mitch Marner and he talked to Mitch Marner on the phone. But statistically, in terms of fantasy, I, I actually think Nazem Kadri is going to be a pretty good comparable for Easton Count. I know they don't play the same position, but in terms of a little bit of two way, a lot of fire and feistiness, going to get some penalty minutes if those categories count in your league, going to get some hits. London Knight, I think I, I actually see a lot of uh, similarities between those two in terms of just like the what I think their profile is going to be uh, as a fantasy value. Um, so the last one on the list, this one surprises me just because it's a Tampa Bay Lightning player. It's so rare that the Lightning have any prospect these days that is on the radar, but they actually do and they haven't traded him. It's Isaac Howard. Yeah, Isaac Howard, a lot of his value dropped last season. You know, he was a first round pick, 31st overall by Tampa. And People kind of expected him going to University of Minnesota Duluth to be a big player. He had six goals and 17 points in 35 games. It was a terrible year for him. He went into the transfer portal. He went to Michigan State University, a team that you know hasn't really seen a ton of success, but this year was one of the top teams in the NCAA, and they really are starting to build something tangible here. And he was one of their lead offensive guys. And it's interesting because when he was drafted, a lot of people pointed out like his shot was unbelievable and you could shoot from anywhere, 33 goals in 60 games with that U18 team, the U.S. National Development team, that is. Um, you know, obviously not Cole Eiserman number or Cole Caulfield number, but it's still a, a very, very impressive number um, regardless. Uh, eight goals this year, uh, so he didn't really blow out there, but he had seven at the World Juniors. He was one of the best players for the United States at the World Juniors because it just seemed like he put himself in those situations where he could score. And that's a thing. A, go a good goal scorer will continuously find ways to, to put himself somewhere. He doesn't have a ton of high caliber offensive talent to work with with uh, you know, Michigan State. A big thing about them is they shut teams down and they get good goaltending and things like that. With Isaac Howard, he still had 33 points in 34 games, and uh, they count the playoffs in, in the NCAA tournament as part of the stats. So assuming you know Michigan State goes farther this weekend, that they'll continue to go up. But I think it's just how valuable he is with the puck. It just, you know, he makes things happen, whether it's as a playmaker, whether it's at a shoot as a shooter, whether it's on the power play. He does things like that that are really impressive. And he can play with your team's best players because I think he's smart enough to be able to do it. Not the world's best skater, but he has improved his skating. Given Tampa, you know, how they're able to turn guys that are, you know, not expecting to be a big name player and, and throw them into a situation to uh, excel. I think that that's going to be a good opportunity for them because, you know, I don't know how much turnover the Tampa Bay Lightning are going to have the next two to three years. But when Howard's ready to make that next step, it's guaranteed. I feel like it's almost guaranteed he's going to have some quality players to continue playing with. So I like that opportunity there for him to be a, a decent uh, two or offensive forward in the NHL. Maybe he's not a goal scorer in the NHL. Maybe he's more of a setup guy. But again, I think he's smart enough with the puck that he's going to excel. So. A good uh, second year in the NCAA. It'll be interesting to see how he does next year. But um, I've I went from kind of just almost not writing off, but kind of being really disappointed. But Isaac Howard last summer to being a big fan of his right now. Interesting, and and it, it's true. You know, with Tampa, just where they are in their franchise trajectory. Even a couple years ago, there wouldn't have been as much room for Howard. But now, as their core, those guys are all starting to get into their thirties. I think they need someone coming in on an entry level. Uh, AAV that can actually contribute in the top six. So I, I agree. I think he will get an opportunity to play a pretty big role pretty quickly once he turns pro, once the time comes. So that's an intriguing one. It was fun to let you cook, Stephen. These are some really cool recommendations for Keeper Leagues. I love it. Uh, let's move on now. We're going to do our best bet of the week. And I'm looking at the Washington Capitals, who have been quite a story right now. Uh, one of the hottest teams in the league. I admittedly wrote them off. I thought I mean, they were behaving even leading up to the trade deadline as a team that wasn't really seeing itself as a long-term contender, or even a contender to to do anything this year. They made a couple of trades, right? They traded Joe Edmondson, for example. They traded Kuznetsov, who I know was not with them anymore, but still, they were behaving like a team that was sort of moving on. They catch fire, and that, of course, is keyed by Alex Ovechkin, who was written off, left for dead. And uh, to our credit, we did tout him 
often on this show as someone to try and get for the second half because his puck luck was pretty bad. He wasn't going to rebound all the way, but we knew a surge was coming, and that is exactly what's happened. He has 17 goals in 24 games since the All-Star break. He's got eight in his last 10 games. On Thursday, he heads to Scotiabank Arena to face the Toronto Maple Leafs, a team he absolutely owns. Ovechkin, 58 career games against the Leafs, has 44 goals. So he just dominates. He loves the spotlight uh, at the quote-unquote center of the hockey universe, and he always takes it to the Leafs. So we're getting Ovi against the team he always lights up on a team that's on fire right now, and he's on fire right now. And the Leafs' defensive play has been pretty leaky of late, especially with no Morgan Riley, with Mitch Marner out of the lineup. We're not guaranteed to have either of them back on Thursday. I think the stage is set for Ovi to put on a clinic It'd be fun if we see Austin Matthews score his 60th in the same game. Maybe a little torch passing there. But either way, the odds right now, so Botano, I was looking at the odds. They're not up for the game at the time of recording this podcast. But for Ovi's last game, he was plus 130, anytime goal, plus 750 for two. I say let's have some fun. I think Ovi can score more than one on Thursday. You can bet your plus 130 if you want to play it safe. I'm not going to. I'm looking for Ovi to snipe two probably on the power play plus 750 those should be the approximate odds it might be a little different give or take but that's a fair a fair estimation of what you'll be getting value wise so i say go for it ov is primed to light up the leafs on thursday i like it i like it he's playing with so much confidence right now he's happy he's smiling you know he lost to his his good buddy kuznetsov in the lineup but i feel like just the way he's playing right now it's like he knows how he, he he knows what can happen in the playoffs. You just need to get in and see what happens from there. Um, it, it feels like, you know, that that trip to Dubai during All-Star Weekend really just kind of saved his season. Like, yeah. I, I don't know what happened on this trip. <laughs> he, we went to see some magical hockey gods that just remember to, to said, hey, start shooting the puck more and start scoring and and hit the like, actually try to score these goals. Um, but whatever it was, it seems like he's been just rejuvenated. And it's good to see because you – I want to see greatness and I want to see a guy go out there and try to chase Alex Ovechkin or uh, Wayne Gretzky's goals because I think the people will kind of forget that, yeah, Ovechkin's like his play has definitely ta- uh, tailored off a little bit and you don't want to see him just kind of crawling there like, oh, cool, he scored his 11th goal of the year and it's game 72. Mm-hmm. Uh, you don't want to see that. But let's not forget that like Gretzky just didn't do anything basically in the final years of his career. So he had to kind of just limp to that part too. Uh, so I'm hoping we see some good a uh, couple more years out of Alex Ovechkin. For sure. And, and uh, it's crazy to think that he, you know, at the beginning of the season, the talk was almost, wait, is Ovi not going to do it? Now it's all of a sudden gone. The pendulum has swung to the point where, oh, if he gets enough in the final 10 games or so of the season, maybe he can even get there next year. Maybe that's back uh, in the discussion. We'll see. But also, by the way, don't rip him a man, Wayne Gretzky. He wasn't scoring goals at the end of his career, but he was still like leading the league in assists his second last season. So well, no, I will not attitude. accept any Wayne Gretzky slander on this pot. Uh, That's true. Yeah, he went from being Wayne Gretzky to being, I don't know, Mark Savard. Yeah, he, he went from only getting like 97 points in the dead puck and a, and a 90 point season. Those, those are his third last and second last seasons in peak dead puck. Okay. So, Steve, to verify that. That doesn't that doesn't sound right. Ninety seven. Okay, this, so I, I let's see if I haven't memorized. I want you to look it up. Last three seasons, I'm going to say ninety seven points, ninety points, and I think he got sixty. I want to say sixty three in his final season. Tell me 62. if I got it right. Okay. You know what? I'll take it back. I thought he was worse than that. My bad. So I, 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 I was off by one point. I got ninety seven, ninety, and then sixty two. Sixty two. Yeah, that was it. One point okay. As usual, I just got an Adobe update that popped up and blocked you completely. Okay, here we go. I'm good now. Um, so, okay, so I still have. I'm still pretty good at memorizing Gretzky stats. Good to know. Uh, let's move on now to questions. Stephen, what do we have? We'll start with this one from Logan, who asks: The hardworking Zach Hyman hit 50 goals. Congrats! But is it sustainable and attainable for future seasons in fantasy? I guess I know. I don't think he gets 50 again, but what are your thoughts? Oh, Zach Hyman, the discourse has been something else on the old Twitter in the last few days. And uh, aside from some weird, hateful uh, stuff out there, uh, the other element of it that's weird to me is like discrediting just the fact that he's scoring goals from in close. It's like the object of the game is to score goals. Like I would take the 50 goal guy who scores from a foot away over the guy who scores 25 goals from far away. It's so ridiculous. 
Um, but goals it's, are 50 goals. Yeah, 50 goals. <laughs> like they, the puck went goals. into the net. They crossed the line. That's the, how you win the game. <laughs> whether it's, it's sustainable or not, or whether he could do it on another team doesn't matter because he's not on another team. In the current situation, 50 goals is 50 goals. Doesn't matter who he's playing with. That's right. Um, and it's a great question. So, Logan, what I'm thinking is uh, Hyman will continue, of course, to get these opportunities as long as he's with Connor McDavid. Um, we know, yes, Zach Hyman is 31, so he is a bizarre late bloomer in terms of having peak seasons as he reaches his 30s, kind of reminiscent of someone like Joe Pavelski. So Pavelski is a good example of how it can be done. If you're in the right situation, you keep yourself in shape, you're a smart player, which Zach Hyman is, very smart player. And the fact that Hyman, he gets these goals on guile, on positioning, using his intelligence, it's not like he is relying on crazy wheels or, or raw physical tools. So to me, that says he's actually better equipped to continue doing this. He's built to age well because his game is not based on his physical traits as much. It's more mental for him. Um, that said, he is scoring on 20% of his shots this year. So even though I think he's not done his window of being a really high-end fantasy contributor, I think this season will go down as his best year. And maybe next year he'll he'll regress to only, quote-unquote, 40 goals. So I think he'll be in the 40s next year. Still very valuable. I think regardless of what happens the rest of his contract, he proved that that was an unbelievable UFA signing. And oh, incredible. Like, it's, he could go down, depending on what he does for the rest of it, Like he could, it could go down as one of the best UFA signings ever. And that's it, it's not easy to do. I remember a few years back, a G, there, I was talking to a GM who was not very active in free agency, and he said, quick, name one good UFA signing in the salary cap era all time other than Zdeno Chara. And I was like, uh, uh, and I like I hesitated for a second. He was like, see, I told you. And th there have been some decent ones, of course, Marion Hosa, but the point was made. Usually you're paying guys for what they did, not what they're going to do. So it is hard to hit on a, a free agent signing, but they did on Zach Hyman. Yeah, and I wrote about that last week saying he's one of the best uh, UFA signings, like just, just based off the fact of what they're paying for him and what they've gotten out of him. 50 goals is quite, quite the bargain at five whatever million he makes. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Riley asks, if both were healthy, who do you like as Toronto starter come playoff time? Joseph Wool or Ilya Samson? Well, what's neat about this, Riley, is we kind of got like a preview of this discussion because last year we saw both of them in the playoffs, right? So Ilya Samsonov was really good on the road, but he was really shaky at home. Uh, I think Joseph Wall did outplay him once he took over, and I thought Wall just had a better mental makeup, more consistent. Uh, I just, I just think Wall has the makings of a long-term number one goaltender. I just really like what he brings. Um, but that said, we know Sammy's been on more of a heater in the second half of the season, um, and when he's really on, he's a special goaltender. People forget Ilya Samsonov was the number one goaltending prospect in the world. There was a time when it was him and Carter Hart before they came into the league, and a lot of people would have picked Samsonov as the number one prodigy in the game before he came into the NHL. So he had the pedigree to be really special. He still has the ability when he's on, when his head's screwed on straight. Um, Eileen Wool as who I would envision as the better starter for the playoffs, but he's got to show that he's ready. Right now, he doesn't look like he's in a rhythm since coming back from his injury. Only an 80, 84 save percentage. So based on play right this second, I don't know if you can go Wool. I think you may have to go Samsonov, but I would predict that between now and the playoffs, if we see Wool get into a groove, he'll be the better option. Also worth noting that uh, I wrote for Leafs Nation yesterday that uh, Joseph Wool actually has a losing record at home this year. So if that matters to you, mm -hmm. wrote about that saying like, okay, well, the good news is he rarely loses back-to-back -back, uh, when he makes back-to-back -back starts. Um, I think it was only one time this year where he played consecutive games and he did lose um, both of them. But for the most part, he does do really good in, in bouncing back just one game obviously but watching him play against new jersey was not ideal where he allowed a pretty bad goal early and it just kind of started to snowball from there but then you look at what he did against carolina on the weekend and just stole the show like 41 staves or whatever it was and um we know you know we could be really really good when he needs to it feels like right now though the consistency of getting the, him into games has been difficult which is also why i think that he probably should be a starting like the, he lost his last game. I think that he should start no matter what. Like, don't give Martin Jones a chance. Just ride him while you can. Show you believe in him, 
And that's a, just, just a belief in general for goaltending. I feel like teams, after a bad game from a goalie, will just move on to the next guy for the next game. Mm-hmm. I, I don't like the idea of having that goalie have to think about it for that long. I like the idea of, okay, let's say you allowed five goals, six goals, a few of them are bad. You're starting next game. Prove to me why I should keep playing you. And I feel like mm-hmm. teams should be taking that approach more of goalies because it is such a mental position. But that's yeah. just me. I think you're right, and I think they need they need to find out. They need to find out. They know what Samsonov is for better or worse, but they need to find out if Wool can be an option for the playoffs. So they got to play him a lot down the stretch to to see just to see if he can get into that rhythm. Because it's worth noting, Samsonov was really great on the road last year in the playoffs, and the Leafs will be starting on the road this year for the first time in several seasons because they're not jumping up into second place, and they they still could even drop down to a wild card spot because Tampa Bay's starting to gain ground on them. But either way. The Leafs are guaranteed they're playing a road game, game one and two, to start the playoffs. So Samsonov was really good on the road. That's a consideration as well. What's our starting lineup today? Okay, so I think, okay, it's yours, your challenge to me, so I want to know what it is. You've got it lined up, so let's hear it. All right. I want you to name your favorite childhood TV shows. Now you're like in your late sixties or seventies, right? So like, it, it, I'm assuming most of these shows were like hand drawn. It was like more puppets and stuff. And they just <laughs> had to like, they filmed it in, in, in real time because they couldn't record things back in the day. And, uh, but what are your thoughts? Here? Yeah, that's right. Mr. Mr. Ed and uh, my, was my favorite show, Andy Griffith. Uh, okay. So my criteria for childhood TV shows, I, I said I had to have started the show before I turned 10 for it to count as a childhood show. Okay. And also, I, I ruled out like Hockey Night in Canada was probably the show I watched the most as a kid, but I, I don't count that as a quote unquote show. So, number six, The Fresh Prince of Bel Air. It was a staple for me in my household growing up. It was a show that, like, I think it was pretty well acted. It had some poignant moments, but it was also goofy and funny. And it was Will. Smith at his most charismatic and the chemistry with Carlton was great. So I, I enjoyed Fresh Prince. Number five, Saved by the Bell. That was a classic throw it on after school in the early 90s. Uh, and everyone had a crush on Kelly Kapowski, of course, <laughs> including uh, I think it was uh, <laughs> Yanni Ninema. Uh, he, I, I remember talking to him during the Stanley Cup final about like school uh, uh, childhood crushes. And I know that Kelly Kapowski came up. Anyway, so that's on the list as well. Um, It was just a classic. If you're that age group, you you wanted to be like Zach Morris, all that kind of stuff. Number four, and this is this one, like I said, I started before turning 10. Maybe I shouldn't have, but Beverly Hills 90210 was one I watched. I learned a lot from that show uh, as a kid. I basically lived the life of Brandon Walsh because he was a twin, had a female twin sister. He worked at the school paper had big hair and sideburns. Like basically I was him. That's my life. I have a twin sister. I've worked at the school paper. So apparently I just copied Brandon Walsh's life. Um, but it, it was a great show. And uh, I've actually been rewatching it with my wife and it's pretty fascinating. It's way preachier than I remember. It had a lot of lessons for, for tweens. Uh, number three, Transformers. I just think Transformers had a little edge to it, especially in the movie. Uh, I liked that it had a little nastiness. Like Megatron was a pretty vicious villain for like a kid's show. I don't think they make him like that anymore. As someone with young kids who sees the types of shows that are putting out there, that are, that are put out there, the stakes are not as high. There's less peril. And I think the villains are less evil. But uh, to me, just the Decepticons, the characters are really cool. Soundwave, Megatron, Starscream. They made the Autobots cooler because they actually had a real villain to battle. Uh, number two, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. And it's peak... I was pretty obsessed. That was so late 80s, early 90s. That's when I was a little kid. Uh, And the turtles were an absolute phenomenon, which I was obsessed with. And fun fact, the voice of the Shredder is Uncle Phil from Fresh Prince. Uncle Phil did the voice of the Shredder on Ninja Turtles. I feel like not many people know that. It's probably going to blow their minds. And number one, I have The Simpsons. So I don't watch Simpsons anymore, but I watched the first 10 seasons, it was a staple for me. It was hilarious. It was intelligent. It was poignant even when it wanted to be. And that was sort of like my go-to. Uh, it was always on after school as well or like around dinner time. So I used to watch it all the time. And it was amazing. I had so many laughs watching it. And uh, I don't, I, if, if I revisit the old episodes, like from the time I watched, they still absolutely slay me. I think they're funnier than they've ever been. Uh, I just didn't stick with it. It's just 30 seasons. <laughs> what is it? 35 seasons now? It's just, it's it's a little too much. So I'm out, but I, I sure did love it uh, during its heyday. So those are my top six childhood TV shows. So I've, I've said before, I like watching 
the new episodes. Part of it is because as much as the older episodes are, are no one's going to say they're not funnier because they, they were funnier. Uh, I also being, you know, a nineties kid, I understand a lot more of the references that are made in the last 15 years than I yes. understood in the, before I was born one. Although, and again, it's 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 not the same. It's not the same charm, and it feels like some of it's forced. But I still enjoy it. Now, my one question for you is: Did you see the latest Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles movie, the animated movie? I can't loved remember. it. I thought yeah. it was fantastic. Mutant Mayhem. Mutant. I took my daughter to see it. It was great. It was one of the best animated movies I've seen in quite some time. I think I've asked you that before, but I, I this is more of a PSA for everybody else. Go watch it. It's awesome. It's uh, I, the animation style is kind of similar to um, Into the Spider Verse, more of yes. the, the which. I had as much as I love those movies, I get headaches watching them because of the way they do the frame rate. So it's not my favorite thing in the world, but uh, I, I thought that it was just awesome. It was so fun. So I saw it yeah. at a drive in. It was great. It was it was amazing, and it was a great just like throwback to uh, the the true origin of the turtles. It's grimy New York, and I also thought Ao Debris was an awesome April O'Neil. Some people weren't a fan, but uh, I thought she was fantastic. Like she she was brought a unique take as April, and Ice Cube is the villain. As Superfly was really cool too. I just loved the vibe, the whole feel of it. It was great. Yeah, all all the voice actors were good. So yeah, all right, guess that's yeah. it. That's that, Stephen. That was a great episode. A lot of meat in there, and uh, we will be back next week. We're going to be looking ahead to some breakout players for the following season because we're getting close to the end of this fantasy season. Thanks for listening and watching, everybody. <laughs>